So hear the word of the Lord from John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. This is the reading of the word of the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Trust, like when God calls you to a hard task, and you have no idea how it's going to get done or where to even start. Trust, like when you have a bill to pay, and you can't see where the money will come from. Trust, Like when that child, sibling, spouse, or friend seems to be lost and they don't appear to be listening to your advice, but you have hope for their salvation. Trust, like when a doctor's report isn't what you wanted to hear, but with tears rolling down your face, you have to fight through the emotions and believe that he will heal you. Trust. Good morning, Sanctuary Indy. My name is Raven Moody. I'm excited to be here with you this morning, and thank you, for, thank you, Pastor Micah, for inviting me to share. I never take the opportunity to share the gospel lightly. Um, I bring you greetings from Mercy Road Church Northwest, where my pastor is Pastor Luke Edgerton. At Mercy Road Northwest, I serve on the teaching team, the prayer team, and the board of directors. A couple fun facts about me. I am the firstborn of a set of triplets who were born in Hawaii to parents who are now Navy veterans. And although my siblings are only two minutes uh, apart from me, you cannot tell me that I am not the oldest. (laughs) And yes, I always called shotgun as it's only right to do so as my natural born birthright. (laughs) But before I want to move forward, I also, again, want to thank you for having me, and thank you to those who are here visiting with me. But enough about me. I want to pray in before I jump into today's message. Let's pray. Tell me, Father, I thank you for this message that you gave me to share, God. I thank you, God, for bringing us together here to fellowship. Um, We thank you, God, for... um, just every heart, God, that is ready to receive this word, God. I pray, God, that we would receive it, that it would fall on good ground, Father, that it would um, produce fruit, God, and that um, we would be able to apply it to our lives. So, Lord, as I stand here as a vessel being used for your glory, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. So Marianne Williamson said, spiritual work is not easy. It means the willingness to surrender feelings that seem, while we're in them, like our defense against greater pain. It means that we surrender to God our perception of all things. So you all are in a, se- in a series called Surrender. What does it mean to surrender? To cease resistance and to submit to authority. By a show of hands, how many people have ever been in a situation where a parent, teacher, mentor, pastor, or even God himself prompted you to do something that you weren't quite sure of, or if you were on board with it, or even the possible outcome and how it might affect you? Anybody? Yes, all of us. So even if sometimes we know that that thing is a good thing, there's something about that task or decision that can sometimes make us uncomfortable. And this is where trust comes in. If you haven't guessed by now, today my message is on surrendering our trust. 
I remember in 2019 being at the Nora Public Library and God prompting me to tell a man that he loved him. He looked a little rough around the edges and I was so afraid that this man would think I was crazy. So I didn't do it. And for years I carried that burden because I never know what that man was going through or what he needed in that moment. I could have been the vessel that God used to reach him or to encourage him, but I let my fear and my pride stand in the way. I let my emotions get in the way of my trust, my faith, and my obedience. I didn't trust, and who knows what that lack of trust cost. So what does that have to do with the scripture that we read? Well, I don't want to assume that any of us know what Palm Sunday was or um, that we know what's happening in the text. So I'm going to reread today's text and then summarize what's happening. So John 12, verses 12 through 19. The next day, the, the crowd that had come for the festival heard Jesus, that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's coat. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people because they had heard that what he had performed this when he had performed this miracle went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, "See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him." So in this text, Jesus is preparing to make a decision to lay down his life for every last one of us. The people at this time were excited because they thought he was coming to be their king, but he was really coming to establish God's kingdom here on earth. They cried Hosanna on this day, but just a few days later, they would support his crucifixion, although he was an innocent man. Jesus knew what was coming. He knew that it would be painful. He knew that he didn't deserve the mistreatment and the torture that he was to receive. He knew that he would have to put his feelings and his flesh aside in order to not only follow the will of God, but to do something that will inconvenience himself in order to serve others. Knowing all this, Jesus still chose to surrender his trust and his life to God. So five reasons to surrender our trust to God. This is not an exhaustive list, but here are some very important things to remember. Number one, surrendering our trust to God brings peace. This um, tr Surrendering our lives and our trust to God takes the issues out of our hands. It takes the feeling of control or the, or the feeling of burden off of us because it frees us from our self-reliance or our limitations. Isaiah 26 and 3 says, if you keep in perfect peace, you will keep in perfect peace those whose mind are steadfast because they trust in you. It may not be easy, but when we realize that the weight is not on us, it lifts the weight off our shoulders because we serve the all-powerful, all-knowing, and fully in control God. This is the God who keeps the sun, the moon, and the earth right where it's supposed to be. The God who spoke things and they were created. Surely nothing that you trust him with is too big. Number two, he tells us to surrender and to trust him. There are many scriptures that tell us to trust God. Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6, which I read in the beginning, was just one of them. But as I was preparing this message, the one that really stood out to me was Hebrews 11 and 6. And it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. The entire chapter of Hebrews 11 is about active faith. Yes, believing in Christ, believing that he died and rose for us, but also faith that he will come through for us. He's not a man that he should lie. And anything that he has said cannot return to him void. It must accomplish what he set it out to do. God wants us to trust in him, to have faith in him, whatever it is that he may call us to do. Number three, 
Surrendering and trusting God gives him room to do the supernatural. Miracles are what is, is what it's called when God supernaturally steps into our natural and invades our natural. God does things that we ourselves cannot do or that seem improbable. Psalms 37 and 5, commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. The New Living Translation of that same text says, commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. Merriam-Webster says that a miracle is an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. God will always step into our circumstances. We see so many times in the Bible, God do miraculous things. Oftentimes, it only took a willingness. Peter was one example where he stepped out on water and he stayed afloat as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus and not the storm around him. The woman with the issue of blood, she trusted that, God, that Jesus could heal her. Will you trust God today? Erwin Lutzer says, you become stronger only when you become weaker. When you surrender your will to God, you discover the resources to, resources to do what God requires. Number four, surrendering and trusting God can benefit others. There are literally people waiting for you, each and every one of us, to do what he's called us to do. The book, the business, the mentorship, starting the small group, the volunteer or service opportunity, sharing Christ with the stranger. You never know how God can use your surrender. Esther said yes before going to the king because she trusted God. Yes, at first she was fearful, but she was told that who knows if she was put in place for such a time as this. And when she trusted God, she found out that she indeed was put there. If we go all the way back to early in the Old Testament, Noah, he trusted God and he saved the human race. Joseph, he trusted God. And when he made it to the palace, he was able to save his family from famine. Jesus, he trusted God with his life. And now we not only have eternal life, when we have faith in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, but we also have direct access to God at all times. Trust God with your yes. He can use every last one of us as a vessel to be a blessing to someone else. Number five, surrendering and trusting God grows our faith. Back to Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. He will make your path straight. When you have to decide not to follow your own limited view, your own limited understanding and perspective, it exercises your faith muscle. We learn that when we lean on him and his infinite power and understanding, he will lead us on the path we should take. Someone here might be thinking, well, how do I know what the right path is? Just keep walking with him. The Bible says that his sheep know his voice and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. Keep walking with him. Keep praying. I love the quote that says, you can't say that God hasn't spoken to you if you haven't opened your Bible. Here's a bonus one. It won't be on the slides, but fasting. It's not a cure-all or a magical way to manipulate God. Our flesh is at enmity with God. It cannot please him. So sometimes we have to deny our flesh in order to get into an intimate space in order to hear from him, to draw closer to him and to receive from him. It's not for us to just say, look, God, I gave up something. We want to take that time to devote more time and intimacy with him. Esther fasted when she had to make a decision to go before the king, which could have gotten her killed. But she had to take the risk in order to save her people. Daniel, he fasted and prayed, and we see that he fasted for 21 days and nights, and his prayers were hindered by spiritual warfare, but he kept praying and fasting, and after 21 days, the answer was received. Jesus was led into the wilderness, and he fasted for 40 days, and God prepared him to really walk out what he was called to do here on the earth. We see in Matthew 17, verse 21, 
that some things come through a life of fasting and consecration. Having times of devotion, deeper prayer, denying our flesh through fasting. In that text, the disciples couldn't cast out a demon that was in a boy. And then Jesus does it, and they wonder why they couldn't do it. And he mentions their faith. The point of that scripture was not about just casting out demons. It was about their faith and their walk with God. Now, some get into the debate of, does it have to be food or can it be social media, candy, video games, sports, etc.? It doesn't matter. Just be God-led when you fast. You could be a Daniel fast, water fast. For sometimes, for me, sometimes it's social media because that can be the thing that distracts me from God. There's a song that I love by recording artist Tasha Cobbs Leonard that literally moves me every time I hear it. It's a reminder of the importance of getting away from our motives and our plans and following God's. Now, I'm not going to sing because y'all don't want to hear that. I will clear out this room. <laughs> I'm not going to sing. But here are the lyrics. It says, so we throw away our agendas. We lay aside all of our pride. With the heart of repentance, we are moving out of the way. It goes on to talk about wanting more of him, wanting him to move, wanting his glory, and it being not about us, but all about him. The song is literally about trusting him enough to move ourselves out of the way. And yes, I realize that sometimes stepping out on faith and trusting him may not always feel good or comfortable, but it's trust, but you have to trust that it will work together for your good. Romans 8 and 28. And we know that all things work together for the good of them who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This scripture says all things, not some things, not good things, not even just God things, but all things work together for our good. So if you're in a situation where you have to surrender and trust God, have hope in the fact that even if you don't like it, even if you don't understand it, even if it doesn't feel good, that our sovereign God can use it for your good. So I know it's Palm Sunday, but there are other people in the Bible who also surrendered their trust to God. It blessed them to be a blessing to other people. These people that I'm going to share, they were just ordinary people like you and me who trusted God and surrendered to his plan. Moses, he had to go back to Egypt. He ran away after he killed a man in order to help his people. Once he got settled down and he made a life for himself, God uprooted that and sent him on a journey of destiny to free his people from Egypt. Gideon. He was a man who was so self-conscious and doubtful, even after God affirmed who he was. God called him a mighty man of valor, and he still didn't believe. God set him out on a path to war, only to be slowly stripped down to a bare minimum army, which made Gideon even more fearful. But he went, and he trusted God along the way. Eventually, a victory was won. But the cool part about that story was that his small army never actually went to war. They hid themselves and made a bunch of noise, and their enemies were so afraid that they began to fight, not realizing that they were killing each other. The three Hebrew boys, they took a leap of faith and decided not to bow to a king, and they found themselves in a fiery furnace. They were willing to trust God and die. But Jesus was in the furnace with him, and ultimately, the very one that they wouldn't bow to believed in their God. Abraham, God made him a promise and then later asked him to sacrifice that very promise. He believed in God so much that he didn't tell anyone that he was going to sacrifice his son. He just acted on it. And because of his faith, at the very last minute, God provided another sacrifice. Joseph, he was thrown in a pit by his jealous brothers because he shared a dream. They took him out of the pit and they sold him into slavery so they at least could make him some money, themselves some money. He made it to a good place only to be lied on and thrown into prison. 
Eventually, he helps people while he's in prison, and he tells them not to forget about him, but they forget anyway. The whole way through that story, the Bible tells us that he was favored. In the end, his gift made room for him, and he was put in a palace, and and God fulfilled the very dream that he originally had given him. Job, he lost everything, but he wouldn't turn on God. People thought he must have done something to deserve it. Even his wife said to curse God and die. But even in his pain, even in his questioning, he never gave up on God. Eventually, God blessed him and multiplied everything that he had lost. Mary, the mother of Jesus, a young virgin girl who was preparing to be married, and she finds out that God is going to supernaturally give her a baby. She could have said, pick someone else. She could have been concerned about losing her soon-to-be husband. She could have been worried about what people would think of her. But she yielded to God's plan and trusted him. God not only made sure to keep his promise, but he even saved her marriage. That woman gave birth to our Savior, who on Palm Sunday, as we see in the text, was preparing to lay down his life. Jesus, he walked this earth fully human And although he asked God if there was another way, he asked God to spare him. He said, to let this cup pass from me, yet nevertheless, not my will, yours be done. He surrendered and trusted God and he laid down his life. He surrendered and laid down his life so that the veil in the temple would be torn. And we now have access, direct access to God because of it. He surrendered and laid down his life that we would no longer be bound to the law, but be free. He surrendered and laid down his life and conquered death as a spotless lamb, the final lamb that would atone atone for our sins eternally. He laid down his life only to rise again with all power. Aren't you grateful that he trusted God and surrendered his life for our sake? All of these situations I have mentioned were hard. I'm pretty sure, just like some of us ask sometimes, God, why me? God, why would you allow this to happen? But we have to trust that God has a bigger plan. Again, Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Things that help us to surrender our lives to God or surrender our trust to God. Number one, prayer. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I personally believe that prayer is the most powerful thing in the world. It's a two-way communication with an all-knowing, all-powerful God. The all-knowing, all-powerful God. I might not be able to change my situation or yours. You may not be able to change my situation or your own. But we can invite our powerful Father into our circumstances and find peace because we know that he's got it. He's not surprised by anything. We may be anxious but he's not. Two, repentance. The song I mentioned a little while ago said, with a heart of repentance, I am moving out of your way. Repentance means to turn, to turn your heart and your mind back to God. Psalm 23, verse 3. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. The King James Version of that text says, he restoreth my soul. The original meaning of restoreth was to repent, to turn. And the T-H on the end of that word means that it was continual. So if repent means to turn, he turns my soul back to him continuously. Well, what is a soul? It is our mind, our will, and our emotion. So after he turns my soul or my mind, will, and emotions back to him, Then he guides me along the right path. 
If you want to surrender and trust God to guide you, turn your heart and your mind back to him. Pray that God will give you a heart of repentance. Number three, godly and supportive community. Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The New Living Translation says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good work. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We need each and every one of us ourselves. We all have different gifts. We all have different talents. We all have things that we can bring to the body of Christ. We're not supposed to be Lone Ranger Christians. And if we think that we can make it on this earth alone, we are sadly mistaken. God didn't call us to walk alone. He called us to walk in unity and in community. We can encourage, we can uplift, and we can disciple one another through community. Number four, yielding to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Has anyone ever felt a nudge on the inside of them to do something and you knew that it wasn't you? I have. Like I mentioned earlier, God told me to share with that man that he loved him. He may tell you to sow a seed into a ministry. He may tell you to start a business or follow out a plan of purpose. He may ask you to go apologize to a family member for your unloving ways. Those promptings, uh, when they happen and you believe that it's God speaking to you, obey it. And if you're unsure of where it's coming from, pray and then act accordingly. It is possible to quench the Holy Spirit, which means to willfully refuse to obey him. When the Holy Spirit nudges you, follow him and trust as he leads you. Number five, allow scripture to transform our hearts. When you meditate on the word of God and it gets down in your heart, you will begin to follow that change of heart. Romans 12 and 2. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The New Living Translation says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and perfect and pleasing. When you renew your mind in the word, you begin to understand the will of God concerning your conduct and your ways. Now, and I'm going to be transparent. There were some years ago that I was hurt by some peers, and I had to follow the Bible and to pray for them to bless those who persecuted me. Now, the world's customs would have said I had the right to be angry, maybe even hate them, but the word told me to forgive. I had to trust that God would help me heal if I followed him. In that season, it took me a while. I prayed for days and weeks for them and for myself. And over time, my heart began to heal, and I was able to interact with them with no animosity and no fear. And every time I started to get angry or those feelings would come back, I would have to remind myself to pray again. Because sometimes we think that things just go away, but we have to continuously renew our mind. We have to continuously choose to follow the Bible. Every single day when we wake up, we have to make a decision that we will carry our cross no matter what that looks like. Trust God with your life. Trust him with your decisions. Sometimes what he asks us for may be hard. Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 44. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. 
An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus had to make a decision to surrender his trust, to surrender his life. He honestly didn't want to go to the cross. And we see that from the prayer that he prayed. I want you to ask yourself, what has God asked you to do that you may not want to do, that you may not understand? It may be something like loving someone who seems unlovable. It may be accepting the call in your life that God has been putting on your heart. It may be no longer riding the fence in your walk with Christ. It may be surrendering your finances, submitting your marriage to him, forgetting, forgiving others, submitting your expectations of what life is supposed to look like or how it's supposed to go, surrendering your timelines, surrendering your employment, your relationship with others, your goals, your desires, your ambitions, our hobbies, the things you spend your spare time doing. It could be asking him to help you surrender your time. I'm going to share a story that happened to me a few years ago where somebody had to surrender their trust to God. And I'm going to share how it impacted me. Around 2018 or 2019, um, I was on my way to church. And um, I just was really just having a, a talk with God, just laying my heart before him and, um, you know, just telling him about all these concerns of mine. And after service that day, there was, um, people were just still just standing around worshiping. And I was getting ready to leave and the Holy Spirit told me not to. And I couldn't understand why. I'm like, this is kind of awkward. People are worshiping and I'm just kind of standing here. Um, God, why am I still standing here? I literally asked God, like, why am I still standing here? And one of the ministers walks up to me and he says, can I pray for you? And I said, sure. I kid you guys not. Every single thing that I had prayed for in that car by myself, he touched on in that prayer. That let me know that God had heard my prayers. That even with the tears rolling down my face, the frustration, God was letting me know that he heard me. Later on, I thanked that minister for praying for me and I let them know that um, I had actually prayed those things on my way to church that evening. And he told me that he actually wasn't going to. He told me that, well, you're a minister yourself. You've got a prophetic gift. I know God hears from you. So I felt really silly telling you what God said for me to tell you. And I said, no, I needed that. I needed to know that God heard my prayers. His trust, his act of faith, his surrender, despite his uncomfortable feelings, was a blessing to me because it reminded me that God was right there with me and that he heard my prayers. He stepped out on faith and what he thought, which was that I was going to dismiss him or not want to hear it, it turned out differently. What if what God is asking you to trust him with turns out differently than what you expect? Jonah was an example of this. He ran from God because he was afraid of what would happen. He thought the people would kill him. But after his tribulation and he decided to follow God's instructions, he learned that God had prepared the hearts of the people to receive what he was coming to share. Will you surrender your trust even when you don't understand? Will you surrender your trust even when it's uncomfortable? Will you surrender your trust when you have no clue what he's up to? Will you surrender your trust when he makes you wait? God has a plan for your life. He has next steps. He knows the end result of what he's asked you to do. Jesus, on Palm Sunday, was preparing to do something unfathomable. But he gave God a yes. And through his yes, our lives and our destinies were changed. Will you give God a yes? Will you trust him? Trust him on your job. Trust him in your family. Trust him in your finances. Trusting him, trusting him in your calling. Trusting him when he calls you to forgive others. God wants you to trust him. Will you give him that yes? 
family. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word, God. I thank you, God, for helping us to be more like you, helping us to trust you. Lord, I pray, God, that every single person that's heard this word, including myself, Father, would follow your plan. That even when we don't understand, even when it's uncomfortable, God, that we will trust you. Lord, for the person that doesn't feel like they hear your voice, God, I pray that you would speak to them in the way that they understand, in the way that they hear from you, Lord. You know every circumstance, every situation that they're going through, and I pray that you would meet them right there in it. Lord, let your will be done in their lives. Lord, let us be reminded every day to pick up our cross. We may not be un understand it. We may be confused. We may hate that sometimes you tell us to wait, but help us to trust in you. Help us to yield in you because we know that you have a plan for us, God. Lord, we thank you and we lay our lives before you. Just as Jesus did, Lord, help us to trust and give you a yes. In Jesus' name, amen.